All right. And um, I missed. Oops. OK, we are we're recording. Um, so welcome everyone to the ALG featured speaker series. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Or if you're watching the recording, thank you for watching. Uh, today we're going to be hearing from the Education Research um, Library Resources team at the University of West Georgia. Um, and oh, I lost my thing. Uh, so if you have any questions during the presentation, please feel free to put them in the chat and uh, or uh, use the microphone if prompted. And if you guys are ready, the floor is yours. Let me, sorry, I think. Um, sorry. It was all good until she said, uh, the floor is yours. <laughs> all right, can y'all see the PowerPoint? Yes, we can. Okay, I have it on a second screen, I wasn't sure. You can see the PowerPoint or the other things. So um, welcome everyone. I am Dr. Elizabeth Pope and my colleague is Dr. Philip Grant. And we uh, worked on a project called, which we called Leveraging Library Resources for Research Methods. And so in this presentation, we'll just talk a little bit about ourselves, about the project, um, how we work together and some of our successes and challenges in doing it, and then we'll we'll leave some time open for uh, questions at the end. So, as I mentioned, I am Dr. Elizabeth Pope. I am an assistant professor of educational research at the University of West Georgia. Um, my degree is actually in adult education, and I am a qualitative research specialist. So, I teach. Uh, research classes at the College of Education here. Uh, in our doctoral program, we have a uh, EDD program in school improvement, and so I teach the qualitative research methods course there. But then I also teach research methods courses in our specialist and master's programs across the College of Education. Hi, I'm uh, Philip Grant. Um, after leaving the office yesterday, I developed a terrible sore throat and it's worse today, but I'm powering through and Liz is um, carrying the team today. <clears throat> but uh, I'm here. As, uh, as I said, I'm Philip Grant. Uh, I'm an assistant professor of educational research at the University of West Georgia. I also got my PhD from the University of Georgia in educational administration and policy. I am also a primarily qualitative researcher. I do some mixed methods work as well, and I research uh, rural education issues, especially um, rural education uh, students in higher education and the bridge between uh, secondary and um, post-secondary schools. Um, and yeah, Liz and I have very similar jobs, so I think she covered all the bases there. So just to give you a little summary of the project that we did, we both teach a master's level research course called Introduction to Research in the Human Sciences. And since we started here, there's actually been some pretty significant changes to the course, primarily in what exactly is covered. And Dr. Grant and I actually created a second course uh, as a follow-up companion that focuses on some of the things that we took out of 6301 uh, because it was just much too big of a course. But generally, the course is what we would call one of those survey courses in that it surveys a large amount of material and what material it surveys is uh, research. So it introduces College of Education master's level students to research in the human sciences or social sciences or whatever term you would like to use. So the main topics that we cover, and yes, it is a lot to do in one class, um, are introducing what research is and some general concepts of what it means to be a researcher in the human or the social sciences. We talk extensively about research ethics and have our students do city training uh, as a 
primary assignment for the course, we talk about various sampling methods. We go into quantitative research. So we talk about what quantitative research is, what primary quantitative research designs are used in educational research. We talk about common quantitative data analysis procedures. And then we do the same thing for qualitative research. Uh, so a lot of this is focused primarily on what researchers in the field of education do. And every semester, depending on what programs the students are enrolled in, we update course materials so that we have some that are focused on their degree programs in particular. We also talk about mixed methods research and action research and program evaluation research and needs assessments uh, and how to do those. So one really interesting thing about the course is that it's a taught entirely online and their degree programs are entirely online. Um, we have a, a, an asynchronous format. So we actually cannot require synchronous meetings for our students. We encourage them and we offer voluntary synchronous meetings to work through course materials, answer any questions they have, talk about upcoming assignments. We um, generally will record those and post them for people who are unable to come, but we cannot actually require them to do that. So that is an interesting spin on the course as well. Uh, not only are students learning about research likely for the first time, so learning the ins and outs of research, learning the language of research, um, and how it corresponds to what they're doing as practitioners, but they're doing this entirely online in a mostly asynchronous format. Um, we took this course and we converted it to a no cost course. So instead of using a traditional textbook, we used a variety of resources available at our library um, to make it entirely free for students. And so Dr. Grant is going to talk a little bit more about these resources and how we found them and how we use them. Is that on? Are we staying on the slide? Yeah. OK, uh, yeah, so we had to find uh, as, as many of you know, and I'll talk more about this in um, one of the last slides as well. Um, if you've ever tried to, um, if you have a doctorate, you know, and you read a dissertation, there's no one book that provides you with the magic bullet to tell you how to do your specific study. And we were using a textbook that was I actually did a pretty good job of it. Um, I think Liz and I agreed that the qualitative method section of it wasn't um, wasn't great, but it covered everything else really, really well, like um, quantitative methods, needs assessments, program evaluations, all those kinds of things. And we have to fit all of that into um, 15 weeks in one semester. So it's really, really difficult to uh, to cover it and especially to cover it in any kind of meaningful way, but we do the best that we can uh, to do that. So the challenges we, we, we kind of set for ourselves was we were going to find textbooks that our students were going to have access to um, through Galileo or, or whatever database um, we have at West Georgia for eBooks. And we wanted them to be of high quality, right? We want to be able to uh, provide students with something that will adequately cover all of these things. So um, again, there's no magic bullet. And we viewed it as an opportunity to find um, textbooks that were really well aligned to um, all of these areas. So um, for example, we, we found that our students in the library did have access to um, unlimited copies to a couple of books by Johnny Saldana, who is um, really famous for uh, writing about qualitative coding. We were able to um, find other really, uh, really good books on needs assessment and uh, program evaluation as well. And so we were able to supplement it and, and present what we think were better products for our students um, than one textbook they had to buy that could be, you know, uh, I think the last one we used was about $150. Uh, so we were able to 
to give our students better access to better books for nothing. Uh, and it took us a while to find all these. And uh, we had to confirm with our librarian that our students would continue to have access to it. And there were other challenges along the way that I will talk about soon. But um, we think um, in many ways this was a superior um, opportunity for our students than just having one textbook that covers some things well and other things poorly. So once we were able to find all those resources, we were able to connect some of the other things that we had in the class, like our mini lectures, and uh, which are were basically audio recorded little, you know, short 10 minute or less PowerPoint presentations about the topics um, and other voluntary readings we had and example research studies in each of the designs, we were able to connect those with the new resources. And that is what created our no cost course. So we wanted to share a little bit of our final report findings to complete this little summary of our project. We actually saw a drop in final grade average after instituting the um, new resources. Now, the good news is that the final grade average remained an A, but it dropped to a 91.4% uh, to in the first semester of the new resources to a 90.16%. And one of our big suspicions for the reason for this, because we saw drops in all of our classes, not just this one, is the impact of COVID on our students. Our students are all working professionals. They are all educators in some way. They're teachers, they're media specialists, they're administrators, they're um, speech language pathologists. They're all in in education in some way in a professional in a professional role and they were dealing with COVID not only on an educational level but also in a professional level and so we are continuing to use all of the um, changes that we made based on the grant because we are interested one we think they're good changes and then two um, we're interested to see if this drop changes uh, as students kind of get their legs under them after COVID ends, um, hopefully <laughs> COVID ends. Um, but we we did find that there actually are a wide variety, and, and Phil already mentioned this, a wide variety of quality free research, free resources that we could use to actually teach research methods. So we didn't need to rely on that $150 text that we had been using that we um, may have previously thought that we needed to rely on. I think that uh, as professors, it's very easy to just do what we had, you know, you've done before or what you did as a student, and that typically involves finding a textbook uh, and not looking for a compilation of resources, but to just, oh, well, I have to find a book. Um, but we wanted to provide a few student quotes that we had from um, our evaluations particularly about the readings. Uh, one student said, the, through the readings, I've gained a better understanding of what research is. I never really saw myself as a researcher, but after the readings, I've realized that we, as teachers, are researchers in our own way. And this is a really important quote for us because, one, the whole goal of the course is for them to gain a better understanding of what research is. But then, two, because we work in Masters of Education and education specialists and even education doctoral uh, programs, we're training our students to be practitioner scholars. And so one of the biggest things about that and one of the biggest things about adult learning is that you bring in previous experiences that students have into the classroom and have them connect new learning to previous learning and experiences. And so for a student to be able to walk away and say, I learned a lot about what research is and I learned that I do some of these things already and how to actually use them to 
better, become better. It was a really good takeaway um, and that the readings helped them do this was a good sign. Another student said after reading the free textbook, because we did use some chapters from free textbooks, um, I felt like it can easily be applied to teaching. I never really thought of some of the things we do daily as research, collecting various information on students with varying issues, then looking at the information to see how you might solve the problem. Um, another key takeaway of the course being able to actually look at what they're doing and refine it so that they're actually able to better themselves and the problems that they see in their own practice. Um, our students are also swimming in data, uh, whether it be quantitative or qualitative data. And so a class that allows them to see what they have as data and how to use it um, is particularly important to them in their professional lives. And then the last quote, the books have provided practical and concise descriptions of how and why we research. And so I think I've talked about the how and why, but this quote is really helpful because of the practical and concise descriptions aspect of it. I think that some of our students, well, I don't think I've seen this in previous evaluations, some of our students have problems with readings that are very technical and research writing can be very technical. And so this was one of the things that we really tried to do when we found these new readings was find readings that would be easily understandable and applicable for our students. Um, and so those are just some of the, the things that our students talked about. Actually. Just to throw this in there, Liz, um, I just wanted to say, uh, I remember uh, a March day in 2020 uh, calling Liz on the phone when we decided to apply for this grant. We had been thinking about it, uh, but we weren't sure if we were going to do it or not. And um, the day, I think it was either the day or the day before everything shut down was when we decided to start on this. Uh, so we started implementing this um, a uh, new way of teaching the class with these free resources uh, immediately the next semester. So in that uh, summer semester when we were in full lockdown, that's where that 91% figure is and the 90% figure is um, the fall. So pre-vaccine, uh, the, these these data are all uh, pre-vaccine. We got to go back and see if, if, uh, if, if the, the grades improved or not uh, from that. Uh, also, <clears throat> if you have one of these grants, one thing that we did to um, gather more data about how our students feel about our readings is we designed a couple of uh, discussion questions for them to talk about all of the resources, not just not just these these resources that we use, not just textbooks that we use, but um, videos, uh, lectures that uh, Liz and I created about uh, various aspects of of the course, uh, any kind of content, and ask them what they liked about it. And that was a really good way for us to um, kind of triangulate the data even more with, um, you know, student level uh, open responses. And our students actually, you know, usually when you're designing a qualitative uh, uh, research instrument, you don't, you, you're not planning on getting uh, a lot of text, honestly, because people usually don't aren't very detailed in how they answer a short answer response. Um, but our students did because we th we think because they had a grade attached to to uh, a discussion. So that's something that you might consider if you're um, considering one of these grants or, or want to have a better understanding of how what you're doing is impacting your students with this. Yeah, that's a really good point. Because um, we, we not only did we look at, you know, which ones help them, but we had them further apply their readings, you know, based on the one that you chose as the most influential to your learning, apply that to your professional practice and discuss how you could use what you've pointed out to, you know, help solve problems of practice that you see every day. So one of the things that we wanted to talk about were our team dynamics and how we collaborated together. I think that Phil and I work very well together because um, not only are we both UGA graduates, 
but we both actually graduated from the same department. So Phil was in educational administration and policy, and I was in adult education. And they are both housed within the Department of um, Lifelong Education Administration and Policy in the College of Ed at UGA. Uh, so that means that we had similar teachers. We took similar classes. We both have the interdisciplinary qualitative studies certificate. So we worked with the same professors. I had a graduate assistantship um, in which I did a lot of Atlas TI training. And when I left, Phil took that on and did a lot of Atlas TI training. Um, so our graduate experiences and our training and our understanding of how to teach a good online class and what should be taught in an introductory research class um, were, are very similar. And so we were able to build off of each other's ideas and we had very few um, conflicting ideas. We're also both research faculty at the University of West Georgia. So we both work in the same department. We both teach similar classes. We both teach entirely online. Um, and so we have a lot of similar uh, professional experiences here at West Georgia as well. So the way that we collaborated for this project and finding the new resources was primarily to split everything by subject matter, um, which the different subject matters are organized into individual modules. So essentially in the online course, we split things by module as well. Um, I am, I have a stronger qualitative background. And so I took everything, all things qualitative in the course. Um, and I also, do a lot of work with teaching literature reviews and metasyntheses. So I took the literature review section. And then additionally, while I don't necessarily do action research myself, my advisor at, UW, at UGA uh, is an action research specialist. And so I did a lot of TAing and work with her on action research. So I took the action research topics as well. Um, Phil, while a specialist in qualitative research has more uh, knowledge and experience in quantitative research and also in mix, mixed methods research. So Phil took the sections on quantitative research and mixed methods. And then additionally, Phil has done a lot more work um, on his own and also advised dissertations that focus on program evaluation research. So he took over the content for that portion of the course as well. And so we tried to split up finding resources and evaluating the resources based on our own individual professional strengths. Now, we both have experience teaching online. We both have experience taking classes online. Uh, so as far as course design goes, we really just made kind of a skeleton of what we wanted the course to look like and then trusted each other to input the necessary information and organize it appropriately um, according to what we had determined. Um, Phil, do you want to say anything else about team dynamics or collaboration? This was the first project we worked on together, so that's fun. Even though we've known each other for years, so a, a fantastic budding partnership. Very true, and it has led to multiple other projects and a second uh, textbook transformation grant. So Phil's going to talk with you now about challenges and successes of the project. Yes, the things on the left are our challenges and on the right, those are our um, successes. So as I said before, with the ebooks and, and, and kind of coming through what our students have access to, um, the quality is all over the board. Um, the great thing was we were able to find books that we were already um, familiar with along the way, um, like a book by um, Miriam, uh, who is a, a very uh, well-known and cited qualitative researcher. Um, but I think we struggled more with the, 
the quantitative side when it came to this uh, than anything else. And <clears throat> moving forward, I might consider changing our quantitative book, but we'll see. Who knows? Uh, we've done the work, and and what's great is that it's not too hard to to upkeep what we've got now. Um, one challenge is directing students through the library to download ebooks. Uh, as you guys all know, it's difficult to uh, determine what's okay to post in your course den page um, and what the students should go get themselves. And and one thing that we we kind of struggled with a little bit was shouldn't our students be going to the library's website finding these books and downloading the relevant chapters for themselves because isn't that part of the curriculum of um of research methods right i mean e even though that's more of something we think about in the realm of of of, of um not necessarily creating a product but understanding something um, in the library by doing literature review or something, you still are going to need to use research skills um, in a virtual library to find the content. So ultimately what we ended up doing was recording a video, uh, a screencast, and saying this is exactly where you click, this is what you're going to see. Um, you know, some ebooks are in uh, one database, and so it's going to look differently than another, like ProQuest, for example. You know, ProQuest has a very specific look. Um, it responds differently. It has different menus. Um, so I tried to f figure out which one they were all in. I think there were a total of um, five textbooks, maybe six along the way. And um, I tried to use an example of one from uh, each uh, database to show students exactly how to do it in a uh, screencast. Um, students may prefer a paid textbook if quality is a factor. And I don't have a citation here, but we've been doing we've been doing some research um, with this project, and students are kind of all over the map about how they feel about free and paid text. And students are willing to pay a price if a textbook is really good, well edited. And we think in, in, in our college at least, s with specific applications to um, teaching and learning, um, they like more, because they're practitioners, they like more concrete applications. So if this magic textbook existed, that did all of these things right that um, had uh, the perfect explanation of all of the um, all of the research methods and was very applicable to an elementary education major or special education major or a speech language pathologist then they may prefer that but so far we don't think that textbook exists um, and so we think that there are uh, and 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 frankly i think it would be a huge time consuming um and ultimately not profitable um situation for a book publisher so uh, we don't think that was a factor here uh, another challenge is that the students perceived that there was more reading in the course we had more complaints about for me anyway in my in my uh, course evaluations more complaints about the amount of reading in the class than in previous semesters. But if anything, there was less reading overall. Some of the books had very short chapters in them compared to the book that we had um, <clears throat> that we had them reading before. But because they had so many textbooks, their perception of the amount of reading was higher because they were also going through the process of going to the um, digital library and downloading them and figuring that out and i think that caused some mental strain especially if somebody waited till the last minute to do something um and that increased their perception that there was more reading even though objectively there was less reading and um there's a there's a, a bunch of calculators you can use online uh, i cannot remember the one that i used most recently because i wanted to make sure that i was doing the right thing by my students and I think you're supposed to plan for a maximum of two hours of reading versus 
one hour of in-class time. And we're way below that, way below that. So um, the, the perception is there that there's more reading, even though it's about the same. Um, for our successes, our students say that they love a free textbook. Uh, I believe them. I wrote it this way because I think that this is, you know, this is the perception of a student who who is coming into our class and getting free access to textbooks versus one who has seen a textbook they paid for and compared it directly with these resources. You know, that wasn't the kind of of, of research we did with this project. We did self-report data. So they say they love um, the free textbook. I also did pre-semester emails to people like well before the semester started and said, hey, we're, you don't need to buy a book. They're going to be online. I'll tell you how to get them. They're free. And people like that came to class with um, a better attitude, I think, as a result of that. They think they felt like um, we were looking out for them a little bit. That was, that was definitely a positive. Student evaluations have been, other than that bit about more reading, have been very consistent. We haven't seen any drop. We haven't necessarily seen a rise. It's been pretty flat. Uh, and that's a that's a win. And um, <clears throat> our students said that uh, many lectures that we produced that were about the specific resource we were providing. So if it was a chapter in a book about needs assessment, their favorite their their favorite resource in the class was me or Liz talking about that specific uh, preferred resource in some kind of uh, online video that we post for them. So that's kind of an overview of, of our challenges and our successes. I just want to add that one thing that kind of overshadows everything we do in this class is that I wouldn't say all, but I would say a significant portion of our students either never planned on taking a research course or don't see themselves as researchers or have trouble connecting this course to what they're doing in their other courses. And so as Phil said, some of them just come in <laughs> with a bad attitude in general. Um, but the perception of, hey, you're not going to have to spend a lot of money on a super expensive textbook that you or they feel like they'll never use again um, really does kind of help mitigate some of those issues. Yes, they we are a roadblock. They do not want to take our class, um, but we're happy to provide it. So that's it. Um, thank you all for listening. This is uh, the, the majority of our presentation. I'm going to um, stop screen share and Phil and I will share our videos so that you all can see us. Great, thank you so much. Uh, do we have any questions? Please feel free to use the microphone or use the chat. So we have a comment from Dr. Liu. Thank you for sharing your experience. Yeah, this was great. Um, it was really great to be able to hear from uh, graduate level courses because uh, we haven't had. Uh, the, this is the first presentation that we've had for um, graduate level and sort of like research methods. So it was really great to hear. This sort of different kind of course and different kind of presentation too. I did have a question about the library resources. Did you have any problems creating like permanent links that would allow students to just authenticate that they were who they were and immediately get right into the book? Or was this more of a sending students to go search for it themselves kind of thing? Hmm, it's a little bit of both. Um, we gave them the information. We created um, a video that showed them how to find it through they had to search for it themselves but again I think we kind of felt like that was part of the the, the hidden curriculum if you will to uh. be able to go and 
and find these things because we are a research course, right? I mean, right. That's part of the that's part of the thing. Um, I you know <clears throat> years ago there was that um, Georgia State lawsuit about um, posting things yeah. on um, what are we calling it now? Brightspace. Um, right. It was so I'm always really freaked out about posting anything on there. Um, so I kind of have a better safe than sorry kind of attitude about that for better or for worse. So I never posted, I never posted anything. I, I will say if a student was consistently having problems and my dog is whining, I'm very sorry. He's upset that I'm ignoring him for this long. Um, but I would say that if I had like a student who's having a lot of trouble, because we do have t teachers who are coming to us from being out of like the last time they were in school was the nineties. So they're not super familiar with, with this, you know what I mean? Um, they're professionals. Uh, I'll say, here you go. I'll email them some PDFs and say, this is, you know, this has been a, a real show. That's like a, you know, special circumstance. Um, so hopefully that answered your question. Yeah. Um, if anybody's interested in um, what you can do within, especially if you're linking to library resources within OER that you're going to share publicly, um, there is now a uh, code for best practices uh, in fair use when when you're using these things. Um, so that's that's been really helpful. Uh, Will Cross over at the North Carolina State University uh, Libraries. He's been a real champion of using library resources in the classroom, and he he worked with a whole team on this. Um, the other thing is that I think we really should consider uh, a very direct permalink training uh, thing, uh, like a video that we can provide from here, at least through Galileo. I, at one point, we did have a permalink guide, but I think once authentication changed from having the Galileo password to doing Open Athens authentication, um, our training methods have changed a bit. So I think uh, at least asking about it, if not just creating one, would help folks yeah. that, that want to do this. It sounds good. So far for me, the diff, no matter creating creating links, and we have created links with some success, the problem lies with the different databases. Oh right? yeah. Um, I'm I'm signed into my UWG situation at the library, but I'm signing in like 20 times. I've got different menus, and our students are still can like they're still confused about how to because they can just they can download a chapter as a PDF. Yeah. Uh, and that's that's what we want them to be able to do, right? We want them mm -hmm. to be able to take it with them because not only are we providing them with a free textbook, they can keep it forever. They're not renting it, so if they ever need to go back and look at it, uh, they have right. a PDF. So, um, yes, I'm skeptical of permalinking, um, but if if there is a magical technology that emerges with the library, I'm very open to it. The tough thing is that there will be there will be a few common places where you can do permalinks and therefore making uh, tips for those would work. For example, the discovery system, uh, EBSCO, EDS. But if you're uh, going into like American Chemical Society or something like that, all of a sudden the mechanics change because it's a different vendor. Uh, so I, I do think that it would be good for us to go to the uh, the Galileo folks who do support services and see if they can get a, a pretty simple permalinks guide on at least the the big ones uh, to do that. Yeah, you know, I, I think in, in a perfect world, <clears throat> excuse me, in a perfect world, we'd have um, uh, user experience data and studies um, from our, so for me, you know, it would be what does um, a 45 year old um, woman who has not been enrolled in school in 10 years, how does she go about accessing that library website? Right. Is it easier for her to just go in there and search it and find it the way that we've been kind of doing it with that? Or is it easier for her to have that permalink but be confused about that process? And right now, I think the former is the case. Um, but uh, I could definitely be wrong about that. Uh, so it would be nice to, it would be nice to know which one is which. But at this point, I'm not, I'm not tech savvy with those um, 
data collection methods to get to that level of specificity. Oh, that UX testing stuff is really fun, though. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the nature of library websites themselves and search mechanisms and then what vendors are doing on their side changes day to day. But uh, yeah, I had a lot of fun running UX testing at uh, Valdosta State at one point. And yeah, I, I feel like making sure that this stuff is usable is a big deal for everybody in the state, let alone uh, just within the USG. Yeah. yeah, my worst nightmare is a student gets the permalink clicks on the permalink, can't get it to work, forgets about it for a day or two, goes and does it again, forgets about it for a day or two, does it again, can't figure it out, and oh, drops yeah. the class. That's, that that's, what I'm, that's my worst fear. So yeah. there's my hesitation. Mm -hmm. Do you have any other questions? Got Jeff typing, it looks like. <laughs> oh, I shouldn't be. <laughs> oh, maybe not. <laughs> it says you are, but. <laughs> nope, there's uh, there's nothing doing. <laughs> huh. Sometimes Teams gets confused, I guess. Do you have any yes. thoughts about library links, um, Liz? Um, I, I mean, I agree that part of the whole purpose of this course is that they're able to find things in the academic library and you know other places like google, Schol google scholar and academia and ResearchGate and things like that um a lot of these resources that we've used um the library has a permalink it you know for the resource itself so um you know, we can share the permalink through the database through the library, but you know, once they once they're out, you know, they can't they can't access it. But um, you know, it's it's I mean, it's just it depends on what skills you really want them to walk away with, and we really want them to walk away with the ability to find something at the library. It's you know, really one of the main one of the main take takeaways of this entire course. Um, but we have in subsequent um, iterations of this course in the list of resources in the syllabus um, used those library permalinks um, to hyperlink the resources in the syllabus. Um, and then, you know, when I when I did that for one of my classes, I got, you know, previously you get some course evaluation that the resources were difficult to find, you know, blah, blah, blah. Whether they watch the screencast or not is another question, but then then you put the hyperlinks in and you get the, well, I had to go back to the syllabus. And it's like, yeah, I just, I can't win. Mm. I just can't win. So I don't, it, it's hard to know. Um, I think it's, if for, for our purposes, it's better to just not provide the permalink have them search for it. You know, we've got the list of readings in each module, um, and it's a skill that they need to have. Yeah, that makes sense. Well, uh, if we don't have any other questions, do you guys have anything else you wanted to add before we close out? I think this is um, a really good model for providing re free resources to students um, and not the traditional kind of creating OER kind of text, but in a graduate school environment. Um, I don't know, for me, when I was in graduate school, I had you know, 10 books for a class, and then we only would read part of it. And this kind of accomplishes that same thing without the um, 
unnecessary investment. So we think that um, we have liked this model, um, even with the issues with the the um, finding the resources in the library. Um, that hasn't that honestly hasn't been a huge issue. It is for a week, and it's about a handful of people. Um, but people seem to like it, and um, you know, I I encourage all of you at ALG to cons consider more of these uh, projects and um, see what people come up with. Sounds good. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for this presentation. Um, like I said, this was really great. It was great to hear from graduate level course and a research methods um, course and project. Um, yeah, thank you so much. This was great. I will. Thank uh, you both. Yeah. Yep. Thanks for having me. Thank you us. for presenting. Yes, thank you for presenting. I'll go ahead and stop our recording. <laughs>